podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. <laughs> As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to Welcome smartpeoplepodcast.com. To smartpeoplepodcast.com. Hello, happy 2019. Welcome to Smart People Podcast, conversations that throughout the years have satisfied your curious mind. Chris Stemp here, and we, man, we have one to kick off the new year for you. You know, we have such a great guest, and I think a pretty good episode, and it really made me think this is foreshadowing, like this is setting up 2019 to be great. So let me also explain that this is a unique episode. The reason is it was recorded approximately two years ago. Now, why do we have such an awesome guest that was recorded two years ago? Well, the answer is simple. I had a long time ago planned to start a new podcast. It was called Thrive. It was very much in the same vein of Smart People Podcast, but it was solely dedicated to things like career growth, figuring out what you want to do, much more self-helpy than Smart People Podcast. Now, of course, I didn't make that one. So this was supposed to be the big kickoff for that show. Our guest this week is a guy named Mark Manson. And see, now, these days, that name probably rings a bell even greater because he wrote this massive bestseller called The Subtle Art of not giving a F and, uh, you know, spell out the word, but I don't know how many of you have kids and whatnot listening at the moment, but that book has since gone on to be a New York times bestseller, wall street journal bestseller. We had Mark on just before he released that book. So I thought that'd be a great way to start 2019. However, if I sound a little bit younger or there's some references made that aren't don't quite line up. It's because it's two years old. Mark is a true force. Not only is he a best-selling author, but his blog, markmanson.net, is probably one of the most successful blogs on the internet. To put it in perspective, in 2016, he was getting over 2 million visitors a month. Oh yeah, a month. That is massive. And as I mentioned, his book, The Subtle Art of Not Giving an F, appeared on the New York Times bestseller list at number six, was on the Washington Post bestseller list at number nine, the Toronto Star list at number one, and many of you have probably read it. Actually, I listened to the book, I did the audiobook, and it is fantastic. One of my favorites that I read in the past year. I'm going to turn it over to Mark and just say, enjoy it. I'm glad we found this. I'm glad he was on. He took time. And let's crush it this year. Let's have a great one. Reach out to us. We are at Smart People Pod on Twitter. Happy New Year. Happy Holidays. Enjoy this episode where we interview Mark Manson. Mark, thanks so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. And I, you know, I, I was just mentioning to you, I came across your website, markmanson.net. The first post that I read was called Being Special Isn't So Special. And it hooked me because I know personally, I think I spent, oh, maybe maybe five to 10 years uh, right out of college and maybe a little bit in college figuring out how I was going to stick out from the crowd. And it took a long time to realize that's a horrible way to go about crafting a life. What made you when you were when you were writing that post and when you were going through all those things, which we'll dive into? Where did that come from? That thought process come from? Well, it, that post, you know, I'm glad you brought that one up because that's actually one of my favorite posts that I've ever, I've ever written, and it, I feel that it's a very um, it's a very personal post, and it came up. I don't remember exactly how it came up, but you know, I, I was kind of similar to you. I spent the majority of my late teens and twenties, um, constantly feeling like I should be exceptional in some way. I should be like, I need to be special in, 
uh, stand out in some way, whether that was through, um, you know, being extra popular and cool in school or making a ton of money out of school or starting my own business or living in all these countries or speaking all these languages. You know, I was just always kind of like driven by this idea of that I need to be different or exceptional or stand out in some way. And, you know, as I got older and kind of chilled out a little bit and actually I started achieving some of these goals and I, it was great to achieve them, but I, I noticed that it's, your life doesn't change that much. Um, it, there's always somebody above you and there's always somebody below you, no matter where you look or how you look at it. And, um, and I, I realized that it just, this constant need and, and I saw it in myself and I see it in a lot of people uh, in our generation. Um, I see it in tons of readers on the site, people on my forum, people who emailed me. Uh, they seem to kind of have this, this drive or this, like this desperate need to be different somehow, um, that they weren't a worthy person or they weren't a good person if they weren't somehow standing out in some way. And I, I just realized that that's, it's just a very irrational and and probably unhealthy way to go about one's life. Like, look, it's great to be great at something. You know, we all want to be good at something and improve at something, but um, to feel like you need to be exceptional in some way to be a good person or to have a good life or to be happy even. Um, I, I just kind of realized that it, that's the emperor has no clothes. Like there's nothing there. And so that that's really, and I, I think it was one of those things I'd kind of been thinking about it on and off for a while. It, it is an issue that came up in my life a lot. And then I saw a, I think somebody on my forum posted something and it was, it was one of these posts that I get a lot. And they're like, oh, it's easy for you to say, Mark, you've been to all these countries. And I'm like, no, you don't understand that <laughs> this is why it doesn't matter. Because I've been to all these countries. I could tell you, it doesn't matter. So that's that's basically how the post started. That's where it came from. I love that. And, you know, you should probably take a step back because one of the things that I focus on in this in this podcast is not just the story of how people got to where they are, but how they discovered that path. And I, I think that's an interesting way of talking about it because many people, myself included, I, you know, I, I'm assuming you were kind of the same way. Say you, you graduate from college or, you know, you're in your 20s, early 20s, and you have this life envisioned, um, a lifestyle, perhaps, maybe it's money, your family, whatever. But getting there or what you actually want is so confusing. And I think there's a number of reasons why. But when I look at and, and read more about you and how you kind of started off, uh, I love how you talk about a friend you know, or, or a random guy actually approached you in a bar and offered to pay to help you hit on and pick up girls. And then you, how that kind of transformation from working in that kind of genre to more of the self-help, self-development. Could you kind of give us a peek into how that rhythm in your life went? <laughs> yeah, I, it's funny. I, I actually just recently did an interview in Forbes and I described myself as an accidental entrepreneur. Um, it's funny. I, I get emails a lot of times from kids in college, sometimes even kids in high school. And they're like, I want to start a business. I want to run a business like yours. Uh, what did you do? Like, what, what were you doing when you were my age or what were you planning? I was like, are you kidding me? I was like <laughs> drunk on somebody's couch, not even thinking about it. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like these 18 year old kids who think like, you know, their, their time is up. Like they, they, they're running out of time. And I'm like, man, you have no idea how much time you have to figure this stuff out. Um, but yeah, I mean, I went to, I went to school, I went to school in Boston and, and, um, I kind of just, I, I don't know why, I don't remember why I just kind of always assumed I was going to take a job in like finance and make a bunch of money. And I was a huge party hound. Um, and you know, I guess I kind of just envisioned, you know, this like, <laughs> this like wolf of wall street division like hey i'll get a job in finance make a bunch of money and i'll just keep the party going and um it, it didn't work out that way at all i mean it's ironically i ended up i got a job in finance and i hated it hated it hated it hated it quit after like two or three months and 
it was through the partying, through just doing what I was loving to do, uh, which is go out and talk to people, get to know people. My career kind of spontaneously arose out of that. So I basically what happened is I kind of became uh, like a like a mainstay in a lot of local places around around Boston. And I'd met a lot of people and I kind of gained this reputation. You know, I was partying all the time and I was dating a lot, a lot of girls and and so guys started coming to me for advice. And um, and then through them, I got involved with a local group up there in Boston um, that specifically focused on dating advice. And they asked me to come and hang out with the group. So I went and hung out with the group. And I've got guys who are offering to pay me to, to go out with them and help them. And, um, and, that, and then, you know, I started doing that. I'm like, well crap, now I need a website. So I figured out how to build a website. And then after that, it's like, well, now I need to figure out how to get clients. And, and it just kind of snowballed. And, and I found as I went along I, that I enjoyed it a lot. I, there was like a sense of adventure to it. Um, and it's funny because two things that I had kind of gotten disconnected from, you know, when I was younger, when I was, say, 12, 13, 14 years old, um, I was really interested in computers. I taught myself like HTML and, and how to code some basic things. And I was also very interested in writing. And somewhere along the way, those two things kind of got stamped out of me, you know, in the school system. And all of a sudden, I'm like 25 and I'm like rediscovering like, wow, I really like making web pages. And I really like writing these long blog posts and people like reading them. And uh, I, it was kind of a weird you know, I, I don't, I don't necessarily believe in fate, but it's like, it's those passions that I had as a kid or those things that intrigued me as a child, like found their way back into my life in a very weird way. So, you know, it's funny. I know we haven't really talked much outside of this podcast, so you don't know my story as well as probably the listeners at this point. So, and I don't want to go into it. They're probably sick of hearing it, but you basically have just described exactly my thought process, what happened to me up until this point. And I find that fascinating because the more people I talk to, you hear similar stories. And for me, it was exactly that. It was finance. It was Wolf of Wall Street. I mean, I wanted to, <laughs> I, I always had this dream of, of literally working on Wall Street. And then as I went to graduate, I realized I don't even like New York City. So, I mean, you know, things that I should have probably thought about beforehand, um, but I did go into finance for years and years until the point of uh, an actual, you know, mental breakdown from the just how much it didn't align with who I wanted to be. And at that point, I didn't even know who I was. And so I can hear my 25 year old self listening to this podcast and saying, okay, Mark, I, I understand you. You know, I've heard this story before. Things kind of grew naturally. There was a serendipity to it. You started discovering things that maybe got beaten out of you in the educational system, which, believe me, I completely agree with. But what do you say to the person that goes, I I've heard that, but I don't know what I want to do? Or, you know, how do I build that? Because people still want answers. And I'm wondering what you tell them. Sure. I, I, and I think that's, it's a common concern or a common complaint and, and I think it's very legitimate because it's one of those things it's like uh it's like that Steve Jobs speech you know he says like it, you can always connect the dots looking backwards but you can never connect them looking forwards and um so it, it's easy for you and I to sit here and be like oh yeah I just kind of happened I just kind of discovered that I really like this and, it, and it's like just that simple sentence I rediscovered that I love to write like it sounds like such a simple thing when we're sitting here talking on the podcast, but that sentence basically encapsulates like two to three years of doubt, struggle, um, insecurity, all, all of these different types of things that, that I wasn't sure about. You know, I, at first I, you know, when I started my business, writing wasn't even a part, like wasn't, wasn't even part of the plan, but then, you know, my marketing sucked, but people like my writing. So I'm like, well, maybe I'll write more, you know, and it's, and then I start writing more and I'm like, well, maybe I should take this seriously, but that's not what other people in the industry are doing. So it, it's, it, it, there's never a clear cut answer in front of you going on. I mean, I, I imagine that if you went back and talked to your 24, 25 year old self, um, 
you, you, your 24, 25 year old self would, would answer is like, I have no clue what I'm doing. Um, hmm. even though they're doing what ends up being the correct thing. I mean, I know looking back when I was that age, I would have said, I have no idea what I'm doing either. Um, or at least I thought I knew what I wanted, but it turned out that wasn't what I wanted. And so I, the answer I give people is that I think life in general, it, it's kind of this constant process of trying something and then using the act of doing that, like using the feedback that comes from doing that um, to reevaluate what you want. Because this is this is the this is the other complicated thing is that it's easy for us to sit here and be like oh yeah follow your purpose like you know whatever um, the but people change you know it's like what I wanted at twenty wasn't what I wanted at twenty five and what I wanted at twenty five isn't what I want at thirty um, so our, our desires change our purposes evolve and so it's not. So I think a big misconception is that people get this idea that you just need to find that one secret thing out there. And once you find it, it's like game over, you know, life is solved. Um, it doesn't work that way. It's a constant trial and error process over and over and over again. Exactly. And, and you just kind of, it takes a little bit of faith. It takes a little bit of courage. Um, and there's a lot of times where you have an idea. Like I had multiple business ideas in my early twenties that I tried and they were terrible. Uh, and, and it teaches you, it says, okay, don't do that. Go do this. And each attempt at something gets you closer to aligning with that purpose or, or feeling passionate about what you're doing. Um, but you can't find that passion without trying new things or doing new things or taking new risks. It's so true. And I think as I've looked into this more and as I've started talking to people on this subject. And this is one of the things that really um, interested me about your writing and just what you do is it's hard to talk to somebody who is still in that mindset of, I have to know where I'm going to get to. I have to know what I'm going to be doing. I have to plan out my future because as you said, you, you begin to realize over time, things change, your desires change, what you value changes. And so what I've learned is it's more of the mindset you are approaching your life in that moment or in that in that exact time of your life. So if I look back on when I was 23 and everything now um, seemed, you know, everything then seemed so difficult. And now I look at the things that were fantastic about it. I wish I would have just kind of sat back and enjoyed that and took the learning process for what it is. And I know you talk a lot about, for example, in your in your post, Stop Trying to Be Happy, if you're always aspiring towards something, you're never being. And I yeah. think that's a lot of the difference between always trying to, to work towards something and just enjoying your life. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a funny, almost kind of like paradoxical thing. And And I think the fear that a lot of people have is they're like, well, if I stop trying to be exceptional, then I'll never be exceptional. I'll just be a boring, mundane, average person. Right. Or they think like, oh, if I stop trying to be happy, then I'm just always going to be miserable. And the funny thing is it doesn't work that way. It's, um, it's actually Alan Watts, um, the philosopher, the philosophy and spirituality writer, he actually he called it the backwards law, which is basically that there are a lot of concepts in life that the more you let go of them, the more you have them. So uh, and, and one way to illustrate that is, is for instance, with happiness, it's anytime you tell yourself, I need X to be happy, you're basically, the implication is, is that you're not already happy. And this is, I've seen this a lot, like on my travels as well. Like, you know, I'll go to these like big tour sites, like I'll get to the top of Machu Picchu or, or something. And you'll like, you'll see somebody who's fiercely angry that their phone is out of battery or that uh, they don't have Wi-Fi signal or, or something just like completely absurd. Like they're actually upset. Like they're standing on the Great Wall of China and they're <laughs> upset because like some little like electronic device is not working exactly how they expect it to work. And it's just like, my God, like <laughs> let go. Yeah. Like look where you are. It, it just appreciate uh, what's there. And, and, 
the irony is when you kind of let go of all those ambitions and like needing all these things, um, you're actually more free to pursue them um, without feeling so attached to uh, to whether you achieve them or not. It, it actually becomes easier to become a writer when you are don't believe that you need to write to be happy. It becomes easier to start a business when you believe that you don't need a business to be happy. Um, so it, it's it's a, it's a backwards thing. It's paradoxical. Yeah, well, and and I think you do a great job of kind of discussing this type of uh, you know relationship with your thoughts in the way you talk about the a meritocracy versus you know our, our current capitalistic system. And when you talk about how back in the day, if you were born a peasant, you knew you were going to die a peasant. And if you were a lord, you were going to die a lord. So there wasn't this concern of moving up in the world. But now you explain how moving up in the world is, is technically or maybe literally a function of how good you are or what you create. And so now the impetus is all on you. And that adds this added level of stress and anxiety if you look at it that way. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the thing is, is that our culture is kind of designed to pressure us to think that way. You know, if you think about our education system um, or even just like pop culture, mass media, commercials, stuff like that, like you, it's constantly reinforced. Um, that you have to achieve X. If you don't achieve X, then you fail. Then you are worse than everybody else around you. And that's that's not something um, you know pre-industrial societies have to deal with. That's not something that a lot of third world countries have to deal with. Uh, it, it's something that's it, it's a, it's something that's particular. It's almost like a cost of our modern liberal free society and. Um, it, it's a psychological cost. It's an emotional cost. And so it, it's, I think one of the, the important jobs as adults, because I, I think to a certain extent, you know, as children, you need to tell children, like, you need to do this, you know, um, to make mom and dad or the teacher happy. But I think once people hit adulthood, I think that that same mentality that helped them when they were children helped them, like, integrate into society and understand what everything should do it hinders us because then you get these people in their twenties, thirties and forties who are like, you know, wow, I, I still haven't achieved that, that corner office and I'm 45 in my house. I still haven't paid off my house and this isn't what I wanted. I must, I'm one of the failures in society. And so they just kind of like resign themselves to, uh, you know, watch real housewives every night and, um, drink a bunch of PBR or something. And, and it, it doesn't, <laughs> Uh, it it doesn't foster healthy um, healthy individuals, and and it's like even if you are one of the people who succeeds, you are the person who gets the corner office. Then you kind of you get there, and you're like, well, now what? I have a corner office, but I don't feel any different. It there there needs to be a separation somewhere between like, okay, this is how our society works this is how our economic system works and then this is how you should feel about yourself this is how you should measure yourself um this is how you should perceive yourself but you know of course that never happens right well and i think the beginning step is just learning about this understanding again oftentimes these conversations that i have the reason i do it is to one increase my understanding of it and my perspectives but two is because I wish I would have just started thinking about this 10 years earlier. You know, it's not that the answer would have been there, but I think I'd be further along in my growth curve of life. Maybe not in my, you know, in my bank account or in my wealth or what I own, but just in my, my growth as a person. And I think that um, that's kind of what I'm, I'm striving to do here. Yeah, I, you know, there's, there's a few subjects I've written about some of them, but there's a few subjects that it kind of, when you step back and really think about it, it's mind blowing that they're not discussed in school. Um, yes. one of them, one yes. of them is like relationships. Like it's just mind blowing that that's not discussed in school. Another one is like financial, like planning your financial future. That's also kind of mind blowing, like bank accounts, credit cards, interest rates, um, but another one that just kind of occurred to me, I mean, if you think about it, it's like what, what, 
we were just talking about basically what we're talking about is how we choose to see ourselves. Like what is our self perception? Where does it come from? What are we basing it on? Et cetera, et cetera. And yeah, it's a little bit of a deep topic, but if you think about it, it's like your self perception is one of the only things that is going to stay with you your entire life. You know, like marriages will come and go family members, possessions, houses, cars, you live in different cities, but your self perception is always going to be with you no matter how old you are, where you are, what you look like. Uh, and so it's important to like get a handle on it or at least understand it um, and be able to, uh, um, to focus on it or, or uh, uh, try to at least change it a little bit. Exa- no, exactly. The thing you said about teaching it in school still blows my mind because I think of all of the opportunities I have as uh, you know, I have loving family and education paid for and all these things. So I have no room to gripe or bitch and moan, and I'm not. But what I am saying is, it still fascinates me that nobody, and and particularly in college, given the amount of money you pay for it, sat me down and said, okay, you want to work in finance or whatever it was, why? And I would have said, well, I I mean, I want to make a lot of money. That's just, it was just my thing. Okay, why? Well, I want to buy a lot of things, you know, and kind of walk through that exercise and be it in a, a counseling situation or in a class, you know, once a week for 45 minutes or an hour where the class gets into this philosophical debate of being, and I imagine how it would have changed. Look, maybe I would have taken the same path, but just how would it changed the actions throughout the last decade of my life is, it's mind blowing. I, I, I can't understand it. It might be the most important thing. Yeah. Or, or even how you felt about those actions, you <laughs> yeah. know, it's like things that tore you up and made you feel like your life was in need, maybe you would have been prepared for them and, and realized like, Hey, this is, this is part of growing. This is part of life. Uh, I think the same thing too. I mean, I, I look back at, it's ironic, you know, like I always, I did pretty good in school and college and, and I look back at myself back when I was 21 or 22 and it's just like, my God, I was so unprepared for life and, and not on an intellectual level, like intellectually I could handle most things. It was totally on an emotional level, on a social level, um, and my relationship with myself. And it's, a uh, yeah, it, it's something that it's per- pervasive. And I, I think it's something that, you know, just the last couple of generations were starting to recognize and, and see it. This is important, you know? Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned something interesting there when you said it might have affected how you felt about those things, whether it be personally how I felt or, you know, and, and I use myself as an example because I know that better than anyone. But um, but I, I know that there's millions of other people that feel the same way. So and, and often people are like, OK, you might have felt better, but big deal. And what I've noticed through all the stuff I've done is your emotions directly impact your actions, which directly impact not only your life, but what you bring to the world. So if you're operating from a place of fearlessness to some degree, if you're or, or being grounded, happiness or contentment, you're going to create better things in your time on this planet than operating from a place of fear or greed or all those. So I think that it's not only about your own emotional state. It's what that causes. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I kind of wanted to, since we talked a little bit about some philosophical stuff, I, I recently interviewed this guy, Roger Hamilton, and he really broke it down for me. And and I, I want the listeners to think about it, that you can't know where you're going without knowing where you are. And so I like to ask my guests and, and leave it vague for their interpretation. Where are you now? Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I think I'm, I'm actually, I'm kind of in a transition right now. Um, I just turned 30 this year. My twenties were pretty wild, pretty adventurous. And I think, you know, I spent, and I spent much of my twenties kind of being this broke internet guy living in all these weird places, partying too much. Um, and, and I think I'm not quite there yet, but I see kind of where the next 10 years of my life is heading. 
Um, my business is becoming much more successful, so I'm I'm taking it much more seriously and investing very very seriously into it. You know, treating it as a, a career now. Uh, you know, something that's going to last my entire life. I'm being a lot more serious now in terms of uh, my health, my relationships, looking into places I might want to settle down in the next few years. Uh, and it's actually, I mean, it sounds kind of, it's not glamorous, but it's actually exciting for me to start thinking about all these things. But uh, I'm definitely, definitely in a transition right now in terms of how all those things go. And now a quick word from this week's sponsor. Use your sports and pop culture knowledge to make some extra cash this week with BetDSI. BetDSI.com has been paying winners for 20 years. With a really user-friendly interface and mobile site and the fastest payouts in the industry, it's no wonder BetDSI is top-rated on betting review sites. Simply play, win, and get paid. BetDSI offers betting options for everything from NFL, NCAA football, NBA, NHL, UFC, and all other major sports to politics, reality TV, esports, virtually everything. There's also live betting, which lets you bet on games throughout the entire matchup, every play and every minute until the end. Both Chris and I play there, and we recommend BetDSI if you want to add some excitement to the sports you're watching. Try it for yourself. New members get a 100% bonus match using promo code SPP. That's more than double your money to start winning today. Just go to BetDSI.com and use promo code SPP to get this limited time 100% bonus offer and make some extra cash on the sports you know and love. Again, go to BetDSI.com and use promo code SPP. It's only a game until you bet it at BetDSI. And now back to the episode. So let's talk about your business. Could you explain a little bit more what that is? And obviously you have this really fantastic blog, which I say that because the writing is is very good. I, I mean that in all sincerity. But um, as many people know, uh, if you just write on a blog, it's pretty tough to make a, a living. And I know there are other things you do. So I was hoping you could kind of talk about in your mind what your business is and what you want it to do out there in the world. So yeah, I mean, you bring up a good point. I I, I tell people all the time um, <laughs> that a blog is not a business, uh, or a blog is not a business plan. Rather, um, if you look at all the people out there who are successful professional bloggers, the majority of them did not start out as bloggers. They started out with some other business, and the blog existed on the side. Um, Ironically, though, I am a professional blogger now, <laughs> um, but it took me about four or five years to get there. So um, I initially, so starting with the pick, kind of picking up with the story left off in Boston, I initially decided to start selling dating advice online, particular, uh, particularly to men. Um, I did this through a variety of ways, you know, in-person consultations, um, E- email consultations, visiting different cities, doing seminars, marketing stuff online. Um, I did a few joint ventures with other companies. Um, and it was, you know, I was basically just trying everything out, trying to find what worked for me, I suppose. That eventually evolved into, I, I didn't really just want to talk about dating. I wanted to talk about personal development because I realized a lot of the problems that people have with their dating lives, it's actually rooted in self-esteem issues or anxiety issues or prior trauma or, or whatever. Um, so I, I wanted to focus more on that. Um, and then I, I just kind of discovered that th- what worked for me was the writing. That's what res- that's what I was best at. That's what resonated with the most people. Um, and so I eventually, over the course of a few years, my business evolved into what it is now. It's uh, markmanson.net. I write on a lot of psychological, cultural, philosophical topics that you and I have been talking about. Um, And I still have uh, a book, a dating book that I wrote a few years ago that has become very popular and and it's been selling very well on Amazon. And then I, and then I have a membership portion of my site, which um, includes some online courses, video seminars, things like that for people. And so that's my full-time income at this point. I mean, that's my full-time business. I used to have other projects running. I used to, so for instance, I had like a a video sharing site a few years ago. I had some 
political sites, like had built some AdSense sites, wrote a couple info products for different markets and whatnot. And um, when the self de- when the self development stuff, my current blog really started taking off a couple of years ago. I just I closed shop on everything else, mm-hmm. so I could focus 100 percent of my attention on this. But yeah, I mean, that's basically what I do full time now. I write about this stuff that we've been talking about, and I'm, I'm currently writing a new book uh, as well that should be coming out early next year. You are a professional blogger, and I understand where you're coming from from that angle. But it's not like if you go to your site, there's a bunch of ads and you know all that. So really, although blogging is the crux of it, you have courses, you have books. So would it be more apt to say a professional content creator or provider or you know I'm, I'm just trying to get a grasp on and and for others who obviously this is a hot industry and it's 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 fun if you can make it happen and if it's your thing what does that entail the revenue sources and things like that so yeah it, it's it's kind of hard to describe um so yeah I, there's a blog component of it i, I often comp- consider myself a writer, but it, it's like you said, I've got courses and, and seminars and videos and stuff like that. I don't know what to call it. I, I've actually got an article coming out next week, and it's probably already out by the time this goes live, that actually talks about this. It's called Artist as, as Entrepreneur. And it's basically this idea that, you know, for instance, uh, it, in the past year, I've gotten a number of offers or um, emails from various agents and publishers wanting to publish a book from me or publish my work in different ways. And I looked at those deals and I talked to some of them and, and it's just like, it doesn't make sense. Like I'm already capable of doing all my own marketing. I'm already capable. I've already got the readership. Uh, you know, I've already built the readership. Um, and then I, I'm already capable of um, generating my own my own community and monetizing my own community um, uh, of people who want to learn more from me or hear more from me, um, and so it's this weird thing where it's yeah I'm like part writer, part blogger, part teacher, part <laughs> online you know web entrepreneur. Um, so I, I don't know what the word is for it. No, no, that and that totally makes sense, and I, I definitely wanted to hear it. In your words, one of the things I want to kind of get back to this, although it's on that subject, you said what worked for me was the writing. And then it evolved since then into all the things we just discussed. So for those out there that maybe they're 21, maybe they're 45, whatever it might be, and they're going, I I want to find what worked for me. I'm wondering what you might tell them. You have to experiment. I mean, it, you have to get rid of this mentality that you're, no, you're going to know what's going to work before you do it. It's fine that, to have an idea of what you think is going to work. It's fine to have, you know, prefer one thing over another. Uh, to start is start with what you prefer or start with what appeals to you. But um, you, you have to be open to recognize, you know, some things just, and, and you'll feel it when you start doing it. For, for instance, when I started my business, um, I noticed that with sales in particular, like sales writing, sales calls, things like, like, I just felt this massive emotional resistance to it. I didn't enjoy it. Uh, I didn't get excited about it. And because of that, I wasn't very good at it. So it wasn't the most advent of my business. Um, I've seen this with a lot of other like entrepreneur friends and their businesses. Uh, a really good friend of mine actually recently tried to start a site and his primary mode of marketing it is, I think he tried to kind of model my success. And so his primary mode of trying to market it was was through writing, through writing like long in-depth blog posts. But like it turned out he, he hated writing the blog posts and nobody was reading them. So it's it he discovered, but in the meantime, he had kind of made a few different YouTube videos to go along with the blog post. And he realized that he loved making the videos. And so... Instead, he kind of, you know, pivoted onto the videos and now that's his primary focus. Um, and so that's just one simple example. I mean, it can play out in all sorts of different different industries and, and different pursuits. It can, it can play out within a career path, like within a corporation. It can play out as an entrepreneur. Uh, but there has to be an active experimentation as well as a willingness to 
gauge one's emotional reaction to what one is doing and then change based on that emotional reaction. Yeah, and something that I talk about often is when you are experimenting with these things, you you have to do it with kind of the beginner's mind, um, do it with a, a little bit less judgment, and then you have to trust that the things you enjoy, you're going to work harder on, and the things you don't should either fall by the wayside or be done by somebody who enjoys them. And I think what I did for so long was fight against the things I didn't enjoy because I told myself for so long that's what I wanted to do. So I I think, you know, oftentimes people have this perception of who they are, who they think they want to be. They do it. It sucks. But society or their parents or their own brain has told them, just keep working hard at it. And you're never going to create the, the best thing you have in you if it's always an uphill battle. So for that guy that hated writing, he could have said, look, I am going to grind this out until I build a site like Mark's. And man, I'm tell- I mean, I know if it ever happened, it wouldn't have been his best contribution while he's here. you know. And so you yeah. have to have that confidence or that freedom or just the mindset of uh, growing with your understanding of your skill set. Yeah, absolutely. One thing that I say a lot um, is that passion is practical. You know, I think there's kind of two people are very kind of polarized with the, how they see like, you know, there's some people who are like, they feel like they have to be passionate about everything or they feel like they have to find something that they fall in love with immediately. And that's unrealistic. You know, it's like even things that you, you love or you're passionate about, Sometimes they take some time to to grow on you. Sometimes they have some some bad sides that you don't like. You know, it, it's like a relationship with somebody. It's never you're not happy all the time. Um, and then there there are people who just passion doesn't make me money. I'm gonna go do what makes me money. It's like you know, like you were saying when you were like 20 years old. Mm-hmm. But one thing I say a lot is passion is practical, and it's like you said, you're gonna work harder. You're gonna be more motivated. You're gonna be more creative. You're going to be more inspired. You're going to be more willing to deal with failure uh, and setbacks. And so there's actually, there's a huge amount of, I mean, you could almost say like capital and being passionate about something, you know, it, there's a huge a- advantage of it. Um, and so I think it's, and, and the point that you brought up that's really good is that a lot of us, particularly when we're young, uh, a lot of us really have like completely false ideas of who we are, you know, who we think we are is largely built on, like you said, what our our parents told us, what our friends told us, what our teachers told us. And and we don't know until we actually go try it. You know, it's like, I didn't know I hated finance until I went and got a job in finance. And then it, and then it was quickly apparent. Um, And so, yeah, let go of that idea of, of that, you know, exactly who you are, what you need to be and, and just let it, I, I, I hate to be so vague, but just let it happen, you know, like let it, uh, let it evolve, let it grow, you know, as, as the years go on. And, you know, it is one of those things. It is a vague, I, I know exactly where you're going when you're like, I hate to be so vague because it is vague. But again, I, I recently, and when I say recently, you know, within the past couple of years and, and much more strongly within the past year or two have finally started to understand what all that means. And so what I've been consuming in podcasts and YouTube videos and blog posts and finally started to make sense. And I think although it's vague, the when you hear it, you internalize it, your brain doesn't forget it. And as you learn in your journey, those those uh, these things, right? Somebody hears this and a year later, it has an impact. So Although sometimes it seems a little, oh, that's not a, that's not an answer. That's not going to fix my problem today. I think it helps get to that that next level. So, I, I know we got to get going here. I had a, a two more quick questions for you. Um, the first one being, in your opinion, what does it mean to thrive? To thrive, I think, is to experience growth or fulfillment on multiple levels simultaneously. So, I mean, it's easy to say like, oh, he, she thrives in her job. Um, But I think thrive goes further than that. You know, you you could say she succeeds in her job, but if she's thriving in her job, it means that not only is she good at her job, but she cares about it. She's happy about it. Um, She's, it's a healthy 
sort of happiness and relationship with it. Um, I think it's a more holistic, it's basically a more holistic way of saying success, I mm-hmm. think. I like that. Actually, I, I, I really like that, especially the first soundbite. I'm going to probably cut that, that out. And yeah, I'm going to use it somewhere <laughs> for sure. And then pay me royalties. No problem. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is along this, along this topic, ha- have you um, consumed anything recently? So are there books, apps, videos, uh, blogs, anything that have helped you in your journey that you think would be beneficial to others who are on this same journey? I'll tell you, um, best book or the book I enjoyed the most about this kind of topic. And my guess is you probably mentioned this or recommended, but I think it's, um, it's like Cal Newport's so good. They can't ignore you. Oh yeah. 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 I have Uh, have heard of that. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed that because for a few reasons, one, it's, it basically approaches the life purpose issue but it approaches it from kind of a different angle. One, it, it's based largely on psychological research. It gives much deeper and more convincing explanation to a lot of the things that you and I have talked about um, on this on this show. You know, the idea that y- you can't just choose your passion in a vacuum. There's action is required. Like, pe- like the psychological research finds that people aren't in love with their jobs until they've been doing it for a while. Mm. And usually once they realize that they're good at it. Um, and it, it's interesting too, there's a lot of, you know, cause there's kind of this stereotypical perception of life passion and, and how it should be. It's like, it's very idealistic and um, Newport's book, you know, he shows a lot of co- counter examples to that, you know, like there are secretaries who feel very fulfilled and passionate about their jobs. You know, there are garbage men who are completely satisfied with their careers um, and, and so he definitely, he offers a, a different take and I find it very convincing and, and I find it to be a very healthy take on, on the whole issue. Uh, another one that you kind of mentioned earlier and, and breezed through, and I'm surprised I haven't, don't think I've mentioned him yet in any of the interviews I've done, although I am a huge, huge fan is Alan Watts. Yeah. I mean, he, the, they have a, a podcast out of, um, just series of his lectures and oh my god, talk about mind blowing stuff! You know, yeah. I wish He's, I could. I really would like. You know how they people sometimes ask you if you could go have dinner or whatever with anyone in history, and there's a lot of people that that you know Einstein or whatever. I might pick Alan Watts. Wow! Yeah, big Watts fan. Man. That's <laughs> I, that's awesome. Yeah, I, just the way he kind of breaks things down to a level of reality almost. And, yeah. and, and makes you just think about what is important. I think sometimes, especially today, is so necessary. Yeah, I, he's he's awesome. I mean, I, I love his material. And then I'm also, you know, because what he, what he does is kind of in the realm of what I'm trying to do mm-hmm. uh, with my business. And, and so, yeah, I mean, I, when I read him or, or listen to him, it's, it's, there's, I'm a little bit in, in awe of, just how concisely he can explain these like really profound ideas. So yeah, big yeah. fan here too. Yeah. And you know, I got to tell you, I just, cause uh, yeah, I had your homepage up and I, I meant to tell you this. I love the part on your homepage where you say, some people say I'm an idiot. Other people say I saved their <laughs> lives because it's so true in, in, I mean, I've now talked to almost 200 people just in some level of success and, for every smart person on a topic, you'll find another one who says the exact opposite. And yep. so it's the, the whole idea of the, you know, duality of every concept is I, you could think I'm an idiot or you could love everything I do. And so I just wanted to let you know, I, I found that uh, <laughs> very amusing. Yeah. It's, um, I, I think one, one of the problems in, in this industry or the industry I'm in, like the personal development in the industry is I, I think, you know, the whole guru thing, there's a lot of people who kind of, I, I feel like kind of get stuck up their own ass. And, and so I, it's just, I like to remind myself that I don't have it, it all figured out. And, and, you know, neither do you, neither does anybody. Yeah. And um, nobody's got all the answers. And, and so our job is to um, sift through things and, and find what, you know, resonates with us the most and makes the most sense for, for ourselves. I couldn't agree with you more. 
Well, Mark, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Before I let you go, I wanted to um, give you a chance to kind of tell our listeners where they can find out more about you. Obviously, we'll link to your website, markmanson.net, which is probably the hub of everything. But I just wanted to see if there was anything else you wanted to, to let them know. Yeah, that's definitely the place to start. Um, markmanson.net, if maybe, you know, uh, um, the the article being special isn't so special. That's a great article to start with if you're not familiar with my work. Um, if you go to the about page, the, um, you know, there's a list of other articles to start with. And yeah, I, I usually just, I, I invite people to to read some of my articles if it resonates a lot with you. Um, you know, all my books and, and courses and everything are, are listed right there on the site. So get involved. Fantastic. Well, again, Mark, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it and uh, look forward to what comes next from your brain. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Chris. All right. Have a great day. All right. See you. Bye-bye. And that's a wrap on 2018. Hope you enjoyed the interview with Mark Manson. His book, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck, A Counterintuitive Approach to Living a Good Life, can be found on Amazon and at your local bookstore. And as always, I know I harp on this a lot. If you do decide to purchase any books that have been on the show, please make sure to use the Amazon link located at smartpeoplepodcast.com slash Amazon. If you're looking for another free and easy way to support the show, head over to iTunes and Apple Podcasts and leave a rating and review over there. If you'd like to reach out to the show, you can email us at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com or message us on Twitter at Smart People Pod. Thank you so much for supporting us in 2018. We look forward to continuing to bring you awesome interviews in 2019, hopefully some new types of shows, some other good stuff. So please stay tuned. Head over to smartpeoplepodcast.com, sign up for the newsletter, and we will see you all in 2019.